Distinguished guests, it is my pleasure to introduce NAE President John Anderson. Thank you. Good afternoon and congratulations again to the new members of the NAE. And welcome to the annual special lecture of engineering and society. As you may be aware, the NAE is celebrating its 60th anniversary, so it seems only fitting that I take a moment to tell you a little bit about the history of the special lecture on engineering and society. This lecture series zeroes in on contemporary issues where engineers can help shape solutions to advance progress. Launched in 2020, the first lecture featured engineer pioneer and NAE member John Brooks Slaughter, who reinforced the reality that for the nation to grow, an even greater capacity for innovation and productivity, we must let opportunity meet talent. In 2021, Kate Crawford, an internationally known scholar of artificial intelligence and its impacts, addressed AI and how machine learning can inadvertently reinforce systems of power and bias. In 2022, we featured John P. Holdren, who spoke on meeting the climate energy challenge. And in 2023, Alex Sandy Pentland shared his thoughts on engineering ecosystems with AI. Today, it is a special privilege to introduce Dr. Rory A. Cooper in what is now our fifth special lecture. Rory will explore the transformative contributions by engineers and inventors with disabilities with a look at how innovations initially designed for people with disabilities have led to widespread societal benefits. Is he entering? <laughs> there he is. <laughs> Thanks, John. All right. Thank you, Nick. Rory is the Distinguished Professor of Rehabilitation Engineering at the University of Pittsburgh where he is the founding director of the Human Engineering Research Laboratories, a joint center of the University of Pittsburgh and the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. He is a VA senior research and career scientist and the FISA Foundation, Paralyzed Veterans of America, Distinguished Professor of Rehabilitation Engineering at Pitt. Rory has over 30 patents awarded or pending. He is the author of two books, Rehabilitation Engineering Applied to Mobility and Manipulation and Wheelchair Selection and Configurations. And he is co-editor of three other books. In October 2023, he, Rory was awarded the National Medal of Technology and Innovation by President Biden, and he was inducted into the 50th class of the National Inventors Hall of Fame. Rory is also a Paralympian. I believe he has a... a I believe he has a bronze medal. Did I get that right? Bronze medal? Congratulations. He received his PhD in electrical and computer engineering with a concentration in bioengineering from the University of California, Santa Barbara. After we hear from Rory, NEE member Nicholas A. Peppis, Dr. Peppis will moderate the question and answer session uh, Nicholas is a professor in biomedical engineering, chemical engineering, pediatrics, uh, and surgery and pharmaceutics at the University of Texas, Austin. His group has pioneered research in biomaterials, drug delivery, and biotechnology, which blends modern molecular and cellular biology with engineering principles to design the next generation of medicines and devices. More information on the backgrounds of Rory and Nicholas is, uh, is available in your program on the NAE annual meeting webpage. I would like to thank the special uh, lecture committee shown on the slide, led by Rod Baranju, NAE member, for its fine work uh, to identify a truly exceptional speaker. Now, before Rory starts, uh, Dr. Peppis would like to say a few words from uh, his personal interaction with Rory. So, Nicholas. Thank you very much, John. Thank you all for coming here. 
This is a special day for the National Academy of Engineering. It's a special day for me. I've known Rory for a few years, and I can tell you the story of his life. Part of it he might, he might mention today is really incredible. He's a native of California. He was enlisted in the Army and the Navy, and he went to Europe. And in Europe in 1970, at least 1980, he was in an accident while he was biking. As you will see in a little while, he is a great uh, athlete. And uh, he was hit by a bus, and he couldn't, he couldn't uh, uh, walk for the rest of his life. He went and he got a PhD at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He was a professor originally at Sacramento, then he went to the University of Pittsburgh, where he started a program that most of us do not understand that it is a significant problem in engineering, rehabilitation engineering. And what he has done is just incredible. If you visit his laboratory, which is supported to a major extent by VA and other organizations, you're going to see all these students and all these mechanical and other engineers getting together, trying to develop better wheelchairs, but also better systems to improve the quality of life of all of us, not only the ones that, are, that have mobility problems. I know it because I visited over there, and it's incredible how he talks to the student, how he teaches them. Actually, per, on a personal level, my son worked with him last summer, and I think they're having a patent coming up for a 60 miles an hour chair, a wheelchair. I couldn't believe that. <laughs> but the important thing is you heard it. He was a 1988 Paralympian. He got the bronze medal in the 4x400 a wheelchair run for the United States, of course. And I want to point out two or three other things. It's not only the number of books that he has written and documents everywhere, everywhere, but it's also what he has achieved with his students and with his associates, really ways to improve the quality of life of our patient. And two things, President, President Biden recognized him last year. He got in October the National Medal of uh, technology and innovation, and of course, the big uh, in Inventors Hall of Fame. He was inducted in the 50th anniversary of the Hall of Fame. I can say that I'm really at O. Oh, I will be able, I will hope I will run the discussion very nicely. We are ready to ask him to talk to us. Expect that he, if he's in the right move, he can move around. <laughs> And you will see really something very impressive. But thank you very much for coming, Rory. And the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Nick and John. I, I barely recognize myself in that introduction. Uh, but uh, and congratulations to the uh, class of 2024. I'm, very proud to be part of the 60th uh, class of the National Academy of Engineering and still in shock and awe of the other members and wondering why I'm a member. Um, and I also would like to thank the, uh, the members that have gone before us and selected our class and, and provide the leadership uh, for this organization that has um, had such tremendous impact on people's lives around the world including those in this room and, and my, myself. So I'm going to um, go through a brief presentation. I think Nick is going to then uh, exercise a PhD defense against me. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I'm happy to uh, have a, answer some questions or engage in a dialogue. Um, so let me... Uh, and I'll... Uh, this is going to describe a little bit about my work, make some suggestions to the National Academy of what they could do to be even more inclusive, uh, especially people with disabilities, maybe challenge you a little bit as well as we go forward. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself that you probably didn't hear in their talk. Um, this uh, picture on the left is me and my peer mentor, uh, who, and he and I are still friends. Uh, Tim was a Marine, or for those of you who served in the service, you know, once a Marine, always a Marine, um, who was injured in the Tet Offensive and uh, lost both legs. Um, and Tim and I, uh, so Tim helped me sort of adjust to 
uh, life in a wheelchair, what it would be like. And uh, Tim and I are still friends. I would say the roles have kind of reversed now. He asked me about shoulder pain and injury and um, uh, aging with a disability and what type of wheelchairs to use. I like this picture. It was from my hometown newspaper in San Luis Obispo. Um, Tim and I are doing our first marathons in a wheelchair together. You can see that the wheelchair that we use for racing there are very similar to the wheelchair we use every day now. And so things have evolved. I'll show you that in a little bit. Um, and uh, the, um, and the, I do want to point out, though, that this is at the halfway point. I did win. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and then the other article I put in there from Yakutori, that's from Engineering Times from the 1990s. I had gone to a race in Seattle, and um, if you look at the picture on the left, you could see at that time, the wheels are kind of, there's no fenders. I actually invented fenders for wheelchairs. Got laughed at until everybody did it. Um, and uh, one of the reasons was because it's not really a great, using a rotating tire is not a great way to shave your armpits. <laughs> um, and really, that friction in the blood is not really conducive to going fast either. There's a kind of a rate limiting factor there between pain and speed. And so, um, the, uh, um, but the, uh, so this, I said that because I went to this race in Seattle, and I afterwards, before taking a shower and cleaning up, I went to a Burger King, not the product placement, but, um, and while I was in line, this gentleman uh, engaged in conversation with me and thought I was a homeless veteran. And we got to talking, and he realized that I was a professor at the University of Pittsburgh and had studied electrical engineering. And um, he wound up writing this article for, uni for, uh, for Engineering Times that first impressions are not always correct. And that, um, you know, and I didn't know about the article. He never told me he was a reporter. So 25 years later, I'm finishing the um, Air Force Marathon in Dayton, Ohio, and I cross the finish line in second, and a man runs up to me and goes, are you Dr. Cooper? And I go, yes, I am. And he goes, Dr. Co he goes first he goes, are you Dr. Cooper? I said, I am. He goes, my son just beat you in the marathon. <laughs> I said, I said that's, that's nice. He goes, <laughs> And he goes, um, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, didn't, I don't mean it like that. Um, can you stay here for a minute? He went back and he brought me a laminated copy of this article. His son had been born with spina bifida when the article came out. And he said, I bought two copies and laminated. And I, he was an engineer and he put one in his cubicle and he put the other one next to his son's bed. And for some 20 years, he told his son, you could be Dr. Cooper. You can be an engineer. You can be an athlete. You can be successful. And so he brought his son over and introduced me to his son. And his son had just graduated from the University of Michigan in mechanical engineering. <laughs> so it's a bit like Einstein once said, uh, Everybody's a role model, even if a bad one. And so, <laughs> and so um, it was nice. And then actually, my wife is a physical therapist, and his son actually wound up getting some physical therapy with my wife uh, uh, after that as well. So um, it's really just kind of a story. You, you, know, you can impact people as engineers in many different ways, and, uh, and sometimes we don't know those ways. The other article is in 2019, I almost died again and had to go through rehab. Um, I had a crash in the Marine Corps Marathon here in Washington, D.C., but I took the goal of doing the Pittsburgh Marathon again as, uh, as part of my recovery. And um, so this is the, um, the centerfold from AARP magazine. <laughs> so so I've, uh, my wife has kidded me. I've twice been a centerfold. Uh, the, the first time was in popular science. 
the second time was in AARP magazine. So, um, and they just run a story about the back the, the power of technology and fitness and what engineering could do to um, stay healthy as you age with a disability. And so, uh, I, also that's the Pittsburgh skyline, and you know Pittsburgh's a city of bridges. Um, that's uh, uh, behind me. There is the. Uh, Rachel Carson Bridge, and behind that's the Roberto Clemente Bridge as well. So that's also kind of cool. Um, so that's a little bit about me. I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, about the impact of the ADA on me and some of the barriers to engineering. So first, um, I had the good fortune to be one of the scientists at the Paralympics. Uh, and so I actually took this picture. This is this is a five-on-five -five soccer played by individuals who are blind. Um, it's a little, inter it's an interesting sport to see people who are totally blind running at a soccer field at full speed. Um, they do a little bit of like this, because you can imagine if the two, of the two people collide, it's uh, not the most comfortable thing, but it's awesome that uh, Paris did a great job and it was at the, you know, the base of the Eiffel Tower. If you watch the Olympics, it was in the same stadium where beach volleyball was played. Um, and so, I was injured in 1980, as Nick said. That's prior to the Americans with Disabilities Act. It was after the Rehab Act of 1973. Um, Section 504 was actually passed in 1977 after a friend of mine who recently passed away, Judy Human, led a strike of the federal uh, courthouse in San Francisco. We got Secretary Califano to actually implement the law. Uh, and that led to uh, employment um, opportunities and education opportunities. Unfortunately, one of the flaws of the implementation of Section 504 was that universities had an indefinite amount of time to comply. And so, um, so I, uh, that influenced on my experiences. So I, I wound up, um, as a little bit of a story, some of the classes at Cal Poly uh, still had these expanded metal great stairs, and you had to get up there. Um, no offense to anybody in the audience, but my experience has been that engineers don't tend to be the most athletic members of the student body. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I learned after the first couple of times being asked them to carry me up the stairs that I need to find another solution. Um, and I used my army connection to go to the ROTC students and say, I will teach you a little bit about what it's like to be a leader, a soldier, and a non-commissioned officer if you guys help me get up and down the stairs. And so uh, then we worked out a, a plan. But um, and I, you know, through that same process, um, at that time there was no Air Carrier Access Act, which just got renewed this, uh, this year. And the Air Carrier Access Act, uh, believe it or not, one time I actually flew from California. I was trying to get to Boston, um, had a layover in Denver, and I was denied to get from Denver to anywhere. Uh, so uh, that's an awkward position, because if you live in California, you can't rent a car. Believe it or not, in the 1980s, you couldn't rent a car if you had a person with a disability. Um, and so, and then you're um, stuck in an airport. So finally what you have to do is kind of wait until the crew, the ground, the uh, true cha people change and try to convince them to, to let you fly. Or oftentimes they say, well, you can't fly without an attendant. And then what you do is look around and try to find a friendly person on the flight and ask them if they would be your, say that they're your attendant. <laughs> and so, um, the other, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of restaurants um, from, um, from the, through the kitchen because there's usually a steep ramp that they can carry things up and you come through the kitchen. Um, we don't have to do that as much anymore after the Americans with Disabilities Act were passed in 1990. Um, although it had its pluses and minus. There were a few restaurants after passing through the kitchen. I went and told my wife, I think we want to go eat somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, the, you know, the primary thing the Americans with Disabilities Act did was recognize people with disabilities as citizens and as people. And um, the other thing is, is it changed the world because the, um, 
the UN Convention on Human Rights for People with Disabilities was based on the Americans with Disabilities Act, although it took 22 years later uh, for that to get passed. But um, it's, that, it's also, you know, so now you can rent a car, you can fly on an airplane. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what improvements we can make. Um, this building is largely accessible. Um, we're working on that, John's request to make things even more inclusive and friendly. But um, it really is a profound piece of legislation, the civil rights legislation. So let me talk, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the barriers of engineering. The other thing that you see on there is a collection of prosthetic hook mice, mice compatible with prosthetic hooks. I, um, the president of the disabled Amer the commander of the disabled American veterans a few years back uh, was, a, was a rescue diver in the Coast Guard, a reservist. And um, he, uh, he had to rescue some unfortunate uh, people and, um, in the, during rough seas and unfortunately lost all four limbs in the process. But he was a computer scientist in his day job and wanted to be able to go back to doing his job. And so he came to me and he goes, you know, Dr. Cooper, um, they've been trying uh, eye tracking systems and head tracking systems and various systems to me to use a computer. What I really need is a mouse. Can you come up with a mouse? And so he and I and my team, we worked back and forth for about a year until we uh, came up with the mouse. And this is the mice, and there's why there's a collection of them is it's such a, there's so few people that have bilateral upper extremity amputations, especially so few veterans. There's really only around 600 to 1,000. And um, that we actually manufacture those in the VA and provide them to veterans in the VA. And so uh, I actually learned a lot about that too, not about how, but, but also that it had, that there's left mice, right mice, small mice, I mean left hooks, right hooks, small hooks, medium hooks, large hooks. And uh, we had to get through that process, so there's different sizes. But um, it was also great, and uh, that's kind of the theme of what I'm going to talk about, is that a lot of the ideas that we generate come from the end users themselves. And if I can share, you know, one primary lesson is, so I don't work design things for people with disabilities. We design things with people with disabilities. Really, the end user, it's their product in the end. They have to adopt it, and you know what their needs are, and they need to work with them. And part of working with them is also opening up engineering as a career field for them. So, so it's especially for me encouraging when I get a chance to work with young people, because you can also kind of get a chance to tell them about how wonderful engineering is a career and how, how well it's treated me and others that I know that have had similar conditions. But some of the barriers to engineering, I'll talk a little bit more about, but I want to, in a, I had the privilege to lead a National Academy of Engineering Committee, and we identified um, role models and mentors, um, lab experiences, including lab equipment, but laboratory layout, uh, laboratory benches, that sort of thing, um, software, and, um, and field work. So I actually be able to go out into the field and do things. Now, you know, even in my own work in bioengineering, we, we do go out to people's homes and out into the communities and their workplaces. You know, but if you're in civil or construction engineering, you have to get out on job sites and things like that. So um, those are the kind of the barriers that we need to work on. Uh, I will challenge you all, and maybe this is the National Academy can actually work on. The Americans with Disabilities Act was renewed this spring and revised. And one of the provisions in there is that institutions receiving federal funds are now going to be required to use accessible software. Okay. As, as we heard earlier, uh, that is a result of a couple of National Academy reports regarding people with disabilities in, in uh, engineering or in, in STEM with two M's, mathematics and medicine. 
And, um, and I will, if you now, well, your challenge is when you go back, uh, look at a screen reader and see if you can use the engineering software that you use to teach your students with or that you use in your companies. And so uh, hopefully we can, maybe the National Academy could take out a study on actually how to make uh, engineering and scientific software accessible. But um, I know the talent is in this room, so we, let's take that on as a challenge. Um, so I've kind of alluded to this, but the National Council on Disability is actually a small federal agency that advises the president on issues related to people with disabilities. And uh, their, um, one of their recent reports, I love this, this, uh, this is the, sort of the opening statement of their advice to the president about technology and, uh, and products is that the disability community knows better than anybody else and it's critical to the success that they be involved no matter how far that technology is in the future. I'd also like to point out I'm, I'm sort of... Um, Proud of my two former students and now colleagues at the University of Pittsburgh, Brandon Davler and Jonathan Duvall. Uh, Brandon's an engineering science PhD and Jonathan's a mechanical engineering PhD. Um, I'm a sort of an equal opportunity advisor. And uh, uh, by the way, that's the other centerfold picture. <laughs> the, uh, that they, uh, they also, are, you know, so they trained with me and now colleagues of mine. Uh, let me, I mentioned I talk about a little bit about some uh, people with disabilities who are engineers and inventors. Um, so I'll start with Ralph Teeter. Uh, Ralph uh, was uh, blind. Uh, he required uh, a chauffeur or driver to go anywhere, but he was also an engineer and ran an engineering company. Um, and Ralph invented cruise control. Uh, you might wonder why Ralph invented cruise control. Well, Ralph invented cruise control because he didn't like the erratic driving behavior of his chauffeur. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're visually impaired, you can't drive. You don't like the driving of other people. You invent cruise control so at least you could moderate their driving or improve their driving. And um, Ralph, unfortunately, um, is sort of predates the eligibility to be in the NAE. Uh, then, uh, of course, Hugh Hare, um, MIT. I know that we have some MIT colleagues in the audience. Um, MIT, or Hugh's been a friend of mine for close to 30 years now. Um, lost both legs uh, in a climbing accident, uh, a uh, mountain climbing, rock climbing accident. A pretty amazing guy. Uh, went on, got his, uh, uh, I think his bachelor's, master's, and PhD all at MIT in engineering. He works in the MIT in, uh, Media Lab and um, is also an inventor, a number of patents, started some kind of entrepreneur. And Hugh is, I think, one of the leading experts on actually human robot integration. So I do work in robots, but he has basically implanted sensors. So I will, I, I'm, you're a, most of engineers, you know, I, I tell my students, one of the, I think one of the key things about being a practical engineer and having your inventions come to life is you have to eat your own dog food. And uh, Hugh is one of those people, right? He's implanted electrodes in his leg, um, and then he's built his own prosthetics. Those are powered ankles, powered knees, uh, to allow him to walk up and down stairs, and, um, and then taking the extra step of either licensing that technology or building some of that technology. So um, it, there's, it's really, now he's driven by a lot by his own motivations, but of course it, it helps people uh, in much broader areas than you might think. Um, Jaco is a, a member of the academy, I believe, and uh, a former colleague of John's at Carnegie Mellon, uh, then uh, was stolen away by IBM. I saw that some members of IBM got elected to the academy today, I'm sure there are many others. And she is one of the uh, world's leaders on, on web accessibility. And um, it's, you, it's, what's kind of interesting about her work is a lot of it was designed to make the World Wide Web accessible for people who are, have visual impairments. But I'd be willing to bet that um, all of you use 
aspects of her project, products or her inventions whenever you use the web. Um, also, speaking of the web, and another member of the Academy, uh, Vint Cerf, right, is one of the creators of the, of the Internet. Uh, I think Ridge was ARPANET, to give a plug to my alma mater. Uh, UC Santa Barbara was one of the first places that had, they connected. And, um, and Vint also has a, has a hearing impairment and, uh, and is an amazing inventor in other ways and scientist and contributor. And so, uh, the, the other, and I'd be willing to bet that in your universe and your corporations, you also have other uh, engineers, scientists, and inventors with disabilities, but you just may not always know about it because not all of them are visible and not all of them are working in accessibility. Um, I think that really the key thing, though, is design is an extension of the person. I can't, I, you know, with my sports background and being for the Paralympics, these are literally pictures I took at Paris a few weeks ago. Um, to give you an idea, I showed you the early picture of me in a racing wheelchair. Uh, this is what Paralympians use in the racing wheelchairs now. Um, and if you notice, they are all using the fenders I mentioned. <laughs> Uh, they are also all using the steering gear that makes it easier to go around the curves that we invented. I, I was one of the inventors up in the 1980s. Another example is if you just look at how, if you get the technology to match, the, by the way, um, to give you an idea, any, any sort of uh, thought about how fast you can do a marathon in a wheelchair today? So the world record is under an hour and five minutes. So I would also be willing to bet, I guess we can find out, if you uh, come to Pittsburgh in the spring, I probably am still the fastest National Academy member in the marathon. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the other picture is Melissa Stockwell. I, Melissa was an MP, uh, 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 lost a leg after an IED attack in Iraq. Uh, went on to, I met Melissa while she was a, was recovering at Walter Reed. Uh, Melissa is now uh, four or five times, I'd say 12, 16, 20. It's four-time Paralympian uh, in swimming. And she, this is uh, Melissa. Uh, I yelled at her when she was finished from the, the, the triathlon at the, in Paris. So she yelled and smiled at me and held up the American flag. And I, got, I was able to snap this great picture. But you can see the way, you know, the prostate limb matching your ability and, and, and uh, her socket. And I'd, I'd be willing to wager that Melissa could beat at least 90% of us in, this, in the triathlon in this room. So, um, you know. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, that's enabling technology, right? The bicycle that she's had modified. So yes, she pedals her bicycle with uh, just one leg, and so she, her seat inco incorporates the socket, and then she pedals with one leg. And, and she, can, she can ride 25 miles at about 20 miles per hour on one leg. So if you don't you have an e-bike, try that when you get home. <laughs> But that's really how about if you do the right job, right? You match technology to the individual and their skills. I think um, what's, what I like about, about adaptive sports is it's some like the automobile industry, you know, maybe still says, I know used to say, so you race it on Sunday and you sell it on Monday, right? And, uh, we can, and these athletes know their bodies so well and they're, they're just really critical about technology. I'm going to show you next, next a little video that I took um, from the Winter Paralympics to give an idea of when technology matches the person, how fast you can do. And so this is a cross-country ski racing for individuals with lower extremity uh, impairment or, or, law, or limb loss. And uh, you know, they can do the 5K... Uh, that is in this sitting position, just using their arms, that would win most races if, of regular Nordic skiing in, in uh, regional competitions. 
but you can see how the technology is closely fitted to the individuals like a shoe. So I'll move on, uh, since I mentioned shoes. Um, you've probably heard that uh, you know, the shoe companies are working diligent look at 3D printed shoes and uh, using new woven technologies and custom footwear. Uh, mostly our professional athletes are benefiting from that now. But uh, um, I work with, I work with John Kuhnholm, who was a Marine wounded in, her, in Iraq as well. I went on to study biomedical engineering at Duke and, um, and now works with me and uh, we're working together. And John uh, lost his arm. And you can see John's arm on the upper right. You know, most individuals that lose it uh, uh, have arm lo uh, loss of a limb, uh, uh, an upper extremity, either congenitally or uh, due to cancer or to, to trauma. Uh, they don't use their prosthetic limb. Uh, the sockets are too uncomfortable, the harness is uncomfortable, the limbs are not terribly functional, and so, you know, John is, and so I put the rowing machine picture in there because, because you can't pull on a normal socket, and John um, actually exercises using a rowing machine, and um, what's cool is it uses that same concept of athletic technology where the material's breathable rather than a hard, rigid carbon fiber socket. Um, he can use uh, bolo ties to uh, adjust it to be tighter when he wants to pull. He can loosen it when it's uncomfortable or he's just sitting there. Um, it's breathable, it's washable. And what's cool is we're looking right now and we're exploring an, in a research grant funded by the VA if, um, if you can make them like shoe sizes. And then you, wouldn't, you could just actually, you would know what your limb size is and you could literally, um, eventually maybe just, you know, order them online from a central fabrication unit. They lower the cost and uh, you could even have one to go to the gala last night and, you know, one to, uh, to work out in the gym the next morning. Um, so uh, these are actually from our own lab. Uh, as a matter of fact, Nick's son worked on this project. Um, one of the challenges is there's about 125 million people in the world, according to the World Health Organization, that require a wheelchair for mobility. And about 30 million people in the world have access to a wheelchair. Um, and so, uh, and most of them that do have access don't have access to a wheelchair that's appropriate for them. So we've been tackling this issue is how do you produce a low cost or affordable, uh, high quality wheelchair that can be manufactured in various places in the world. And we um, started lowering uh, career agami engineering what you see in the automotive industry a little bit is used for crumple zones. It's being used by some of the aircraft industry to look at aspects of aircrafts as well. And uh, so believe it or not, both of those wheelchairs are folded out of a single flat sheet of aluminum. So from an engineering perspective, you design it 3D. We work on software that it flattens it, optimizes the cutting pattern, actually op optimize the nesting pattern, then use a laser to cut it out, and then we, we use a CNC bender, although for low-income countries, what we're looking at is, can we come up with well-bending instructions? The nice thing about Kirigami design is, it's self-jigging. So you don't need jigs for each individual product, so you can make a chair for each individual. So one of the things we worked on is, you what the key measurements are, and then using those to transfer to a parametric design. So, and one of the, the things that we do in our work is we have physicians and physical therapists and occupational therapists and counselors and business people, even a lawyer, uh, working with us together so that we look at sort of all the different aspects. So when we talked, I, you know, we mentioned earlier about diversity, it's diversity of life experiences, professional experiences, and training, um, and, diver and cultural diversity, ethnic diversity, 
uh, country of origin, diversity, all of that, help look at things from a different direction. And so what's really, so the, uh, the one on the, on the right actually only weighs 18 pounds. And so that's, a, that's actually a little bit lighter than the chair I'm sitting in. The other thing is it can be riveted together or it can be um, uh, spot welded together. So you don't need any customized, any high skills together. So um, I could teach undergraduate students, not all of them are as brilliant as Nick's son, but uh, uh, to put these together in, uh, in, in, in about half an hour, 45 minutes. The, uh, just kind of a fun, talk about accessibility in London, they're putting the, uh, in the stopped lights, uh, the crossing lights, they're doing uh, different symbols. So they've still got the walking symbols, but various ones. Um, the other one I think this is I want to throw out to the National Academy for future meetings. The EU has now come up with universal symbols for people with dietary restrictions and then require them on all menus. And so it'd be kind of cool. And then, uh, so this was from a fast food place at the Paralympics. But it'd be really cool on the signs when, the, when we have the food out there, not to tell you what it is, but have those symbols, and then you could have the, you know, a couple posters up of what, the, what those symbols mean. Wanted to show some other ideas about accessibility. Uh, this, is, this is really cool how the, the stairs sort of retract. The stairs, stairs retract and become a platform lift for wheelchair users. Um, or you could run a lift along the uh, stairs or a nice elevator, not to pick on the academies too much. But the one that's back here is a little scary. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, could do something more along this, these lines, which was installed for the uh, Paris Paralympics. Um, so these are work at university. These are the dorms from Loughborough University. They took a universe, when they built new dorms, they took a universal design approach to make them all uh, completely uh, accessible. So a place to put a lift underneath and where a wheelchair can roll under. Uh, every, these are things are easy to find. This is what the bathroom looks like. So, you know, roll in shower with a built in bench and backrest and high low sink, uh, toilet with grab bars, all those sort of things. So, if you think about it, you know, uh, you have to look at the total experience in the lab as well. Or as, as well. Uh, now, I need to show a quick video. Current graduate student at Pitt School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences is a researcher studying under Rory Cooper. Their team works out of the human engineering research laboratories where they modeled and built the new chair. The chair that makes a challenging trip to the water park, well, fun. I like to have the freedom to run around. It was rewarding to see just how he lit up and the enjoyment that he got out of going through the sprinklers and the water. He wants to be independent. Quite frankly, we let him go for 30 minutes by himself, and that's what he wants. And Rory thinks children without disabilities who witness this independence will be influenced too. That's the kind of experiences you want kids to have so that when they grow up, they don't have those biases, and they can say, hey, oh, oh I've, you know, I've seen people with disabilities do it just like I have. So don't try that at home, but if you go to Morgan's, because most power wheelchairs would, would either electrocute the rider or just uh, <laughs> destroy themselves. Uh, but uh, these are at Morgan's Inspiration Island in, in uh, San Antonio, Texas. If you ever get down there, it's, it's really cool to check them out. Um, also, in to slip about the engineering, um, there's devices like the stand-up wheelchair. You can see me there using it, the bandsaw. Uh, we did a project with Carnegie Mellon and also um, Emerald Cloud Labs, looking at could we take chemistry labs and uh, biology labs, have robots run them, and then you use a you basically program the laboratory steps. That way, they'd be accessible to people with disabilities, accessible to everyone, accessible to colleges and universities that don't have the money to put in expensive laboratory equipment. And I think from science, it will it will actually clearly document what experience was, experiment was done and to be easily repeatable because you could just rerun the software. And I like to give a little plug on the right for my friend Brad Durstock at Purdue University. It's working on the concept for accessible labs using the work triangle. 
So next time you're in a lab, realize how many times you sort of step sideways and have to turn and move. And so looking at, you know, a wheelchair, you can't really do that, you know, because you can if you learn to do the hop thing, but that's not very efficient. Um, it's a way to make labs accessible. Um, we had a good, we, had, uh, we worked on a project with Amazon to make their uh, fulfillment centers accessible using the robotic workstation. So a robot that need to slide back and forth, go up and down, and twist. One of the standards they set for us is people had to be as productive seating as their, uh, as their workforce was standing. One of the interesting outcomes of that was that a lot of the people that did the job standing after these were implemented wanted to have, be able to do it part of the time seating, seated. Um, and then I, I want to show you a little project we're currently working on to make uh, engineering labs more accessible. We call it the Omnibot. It uh, has uh, one meter of vertical travel. It's dynamically stabilized, but it's uh, also so it can move around in very confined spaces. Um, we've taken the cover up. You normally wouldn't see the electronics, but um, but you can access the milling machine, you know, and and, um, and so that you know if you're ta if you're in basic engineering classes or mechanical engineering, these are skills a lot of times that students with disabilities, especially wheelchairs, for instance, wind up observing and not actually doing themselves. Here's using a laser cutter. So we're going to start doing experiments in our, uh, at our own university, implementing these with our students with disabilities and see how this changes their educational experience. Um, uh, maybe I'll just I'll skip that. This is our MeBot. You can see that online. I did want to talk about transportation. So if people individuals wind up with transportation barriers, what do they do? They just stop going anywhere, right? And if not, they ask for help. And so that's a real thing we have to work on. I do know that TRB has got a couple projects related to this, the Transportation Research Board. And um, so, uh, and also if you want to be an engineer, you want to work, this is actually one of the uh, National Academy's reports I had the privilege to work on, um, is how do you get down, you know, how do you fly? Uh, one of the things we're working on is being able to stay in a person's power wheelchair when they fly because they can't really play safely use the seat and so they don't fly. Uh, this is me actually flying. I'm actually using that chair if you want to come and see me afterwards and how I do this. But I have little wheels underneath that we fold down. I take the big wheels off and roll down the aisle. Uh, I have a lot of fun with airlines. I usually the pilot comes out and like, sir, you can't get on the plane with your wheelchair. You never fit down the aisle. I say, I'll, I'll bet the cost of the airplane if I get down this aisle. <laughs> No, like they usually, at that time, they usually stop taking the bet. <laughs> um, ground transportation is also really important. Uh, for those people who work on autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, we have to be really careful to make sure that we don't eliminate people's ability to drive independently as we do that. And um, just also some simple tips. Not everything has to be complicated. Um, some work, things we've worked on for just um, when you travel in a hotel. So um, one of them is if you, I, I saw somebody actually also studies pressure injuries like we do. You know, my wife would drive me, say she'd travel crazy, she'd provide a great, great wheelchair with uh, cushions and the people come with pressure injuries and they'd say, what else are they sitting on? So they travel and sit on a hard toilet. So we worked on these pads that wrap around toilets and people could take them up and put them in a backpack and you could take a moment, throw them in the washing machine and wash them. Um, worked on the pad. You could just take with you, fold it up, and put it in and put it on the shower chair. Um, we actually, that evolved into a cushion that I'm actually sitting on and became an entire company. And so just tips like that, sometimes they're pretty often pretty simple. And so also we've got to generate the next generation. Um, so if this is kind of fun. Uh, working with the National Adventures Hall of Fame on the, the, these uh, workbooks being distributed through K through six kids uh, across the, uh, around the country, thous I mean, literally thousands of them. Um, and uh, they pick inventors to sort of highlight 
But also what's really cool is I think there are five Academy members uh, that are highlighted in, in the most recent workbook. And so well, we got it. The other thing, I, well, that's an article we've done a couple of studies on, um, just to give you an idea. About 25% of Americans have a disability. It's about 15% from the, from the uh, under, under 65 age group and about 17%. Per, they represent 1% of the students in, uh, in, the, in um, research intensive higher education. And, and then we did this, we've done a couple of studies now looking at uh, patents and they are only about 1% of patent holders. And most patent holders require some, have some sort of STEM degree. So we have to work on that to be more inclusive. Um, I'll, I think I'll just skip this. And happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, it's magnificent. <laughs> I, I've seen quite a few of the things you do. I want to tell everybody Take a picture of that particular address. Next time you're in Pittsburgh, go. They're very friendly people. You don't need to make advanced uh, and go and see what they're doing. It's incredible. And I wanted to say that it's not only for disability. I'm an older person who have started having problems of walking around, feeling afraid that I might fall to the left. There is a disease called ataxia. Some of you are familiar with it. All these things are going to help people like us. I would like to take one or two questions. I know we are a few minutes late, but we have microphones there. Make it a short one if you can. Yes, please. <laughs> I could shout louder. Uh, Andy Jackson, an AE member. Um, I have a daughter in a wheelchair, so I really appreciate the work you're doing. The question I have, though, is you mentioned 125 million people don't have access to wheelchairs. And we've done quite a lot of work in Kenya, and the issue is not particularly that they're low cost. I mean, it would be nice to have a low cost wheelchair. The terrain is the issue. They don't have asphalt roads or sidewalks. They don't have concrete sidewalks. They don't have cuts except in Nairobi. They live in these remote areas, and yet they still need to get around. Is there anything that can be done to improve the uh, uh, terrain accessibility for wheelchairs? Uh, that's a great question. You, well, there are actually wheelchairs uh, um, that can, are, are better over uneven surfaces and unfinished surfaces. But reality, I was in some ways, the National Academy is sort of perfect for that because across all areas of engineering, but in low, you know, low-income countries, you need better infrastructure, right? So it's, it's not only roads, sidewalks, but water, you know, um, water treatment or wastewater treatment. All of those sort of things inhibit persons with disabilities from being able to live safely and fully participate in those societies. So um, we have to create opportunities for people. Buddy Ratner, Seattle. Yeah. Uh Rory, it was an inspiring talk. Thank you. Um, let's say I have a, have a comment and I have a question. Uh, the comment is, you, well, you made a comment about uh, engineers and athletics, and <coughs> you ever saw the boys in the boat at University of Washington? Those are all engineers, or most of them engineers in mm -hmm. that team. So engineers can excel in athletics. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's the comment. But the, the question is, um, have... Um, uh, actually, a, a friend's son uh, who was working for a company that did exoskeletons, and it, it looked uh, exceptional. Uh, there were some problems with him working with the company. He, he separated from it. But the exoskeletons look like a, 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 an excellent solution. What, what is your thought on exoskeletons? So I think, so I think you're right. Exoskeletons are an excellent solution. I think exoskeletons got a little inhibited themselves because they didn't understand who the end users were originally. And people with spinal cord injury are probably not the people to start with for exoskeletons, but people who are recovering from a stroke, who are people who have uh, moderate, even in some cases, even severe traumatic brain injuries. Now I know a lot of work in exoskeletons being done successfully with people with like arthritis, 
or even other knee injuries. Um, so I think it's got a lot of potential. Uh, I do think um, it is an extremely difficult uh, uh, engineering design problem as well as controls problem because you've got to make it small, lightweight. Uh, you've got to make it so it actually... I mean, actually, I, I, when I talk to the exoskeleton people, they say you really should talk to the automotive people more because you have ABS braking, but you don't really feel like it's braking, right? You have, you have steering, you know, you don't, most cars today, especially electric vehicles, you don't really steer the car, right? You make a request for the car to turn left or right. And, you know, how do they get that worked out? Um, but the, um, I think it, uh, there's, those are, they're engineering challenges. Once we work them out, I think they'll be tremendously beneficial for rehabilitation for some people, right, where they can basically, you can extend rehabilitation outside of a clinical setting, and I also think as a mobility, as a functional assist device for, for some as well. I'll take one last question. We are running a little bit late, and I don't want Michaela, and of course John, to be upset. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Uh, Megan Smith from uh, NAE Section 10. Mickey, just wanted to thank you for this lecture and maybe shout out for all of us that as we sort of widen the aperture of what we think our grand challenges are and our opportunities, just a, a chance to kind of take inspiration, maybe a comment from you, take inspiration on the design work you're doing. I got to go to the Paralympics and saw all the engineering in front of us, as well as the engineering in support. And I, I think sometimes when we go into our high schools today, if you go to the tech you know, section versus the science section versus the social studies, you know, we're ringing bells between the subjects. Tech tends to be a place where kids do robotics, which is awesome. I love robotics, I'm mech -y. But a lot of kids in all those other groups would have done engineering if they knew they could work on some of the problems your lab is working on. And so as we widen the aperture of what engineering is for, it feels like maybe all of us could take um, some inspiration for the projects that we're doing, especially K-12, uh, but also high, for the college, the Grand, grand Challenge level, um, to include these design problems. Um, just feels like a real area of opportunity, just like we might add uh, environmental sensors for kids who are interested in climate or social justice mapping and GIS stuff. So any comments or places to start for people? That'd be great. Thank well, you. thank you, that's great. So actually, um, I, I do on occasion, uh, several times per year, talk to K through six kids, um, which they have a lot of energy. <laughs> but um, the, uh, and I tell them, this is how you should, if you want to start out as an inventor, um, for little kids I say, look at something you could do to improve your pet's life or to improve your life with your pet. And then when they get a little older, I tell them, um, talk to your grandparents and find out what you can do to make your grandparents' life a little bit easier. And then if, when I talk to high school kids, I, say, you know, I start to talk about maybe what can you do for your community? What can you do for your school? And go from there. Because uh, I think one of the things that we uh, need to do in engineering is let people see the impact of their work um, earlier, right? So, not to credit, you know, I had great professors, and, and you know, when I, when I entered Cal Poly, they said to me, you know, Rory, let's sit down and talk about how we, how we can modify the curriculum so that you could graduate. And I said, but I won't get an engineering degree. How am I going to get a job afterwards if I have this sort of my own degree? And, um, and then my advisor was a, named Sal Goldberg, and, uh, and his roommate, his office mate was Bill Horton, who actually later went to UC Santa Barbara, and that's how I wound up at UC Santa Barbara, by the way. Um, said, he goes, you're right, Rory. This is an engineering problem. <laughs> we should find out how do we make the labs and the curriculum that we have accessible to you, and then so we would just meet each quarter and kind of say, okay, you're taking this next semester, maybe we can put this equipment on a bench, or we'll build a little platform you can roll up onto, and um, I think that's, 
You know, there's, all, there's lots of things like that. And then we can get kids involved in that. We can get our, our undergraduate students involved in that as well. Rather than um, doing something differently, but how do we integrate people in? And I think if we do enough of that, you can look and say, well, that just works for everybody. You know, I, John mentioned I was going to talk about engineering challenges. So when I was first injured, uh, there weren't that many curb cuts. But there's been a number of studies done on curb cuts over the years that have actually shown that uh, more people without disabilities do curb cuts than people with disabilities. Parents with strollers, delivery people, now robots. <laughs> Uh, uh, using uh, curb cuts. So, um, you know, if you think, uh, if, if you think sort of a universal design approach, uh, you could do the same. So, for example, uh, I'm sure all of you have a, a, a phone in your phone with you. Um, you know that texting was actually developed as an accommodation for people hearing impaired. I'd be willing to bet there are more people in the 12 to 18 years age group that text, then there are hearing impaired people. <laughs> um, and so, and for that, you know, the funny thing is, you know, closed captioning on television was required for hearing impaired people. But closed captioning is actually used more in sports bars than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, that's the, you know, if you just sort of think of those things through. So I will, there's going to be a challenge. And uh, I saw there's some AI folks in the room, because I think AI might be for the solution for this. By the year 2030, they're all, anything that's federal, any, any organization that receives federal funds, all of, their, all of their products are going to have to be fully accessible, which means closed captioning for everything. But that's not the real challenge. The AI challenge is alt text descriptions. So describing that, that slide in alt text for somebody who's visually impaired. And, um, you, and so that, and if you're in academia, it's every class you take, every product you produce, anything you post. Um, so I, I, I'm a proponent of that, but I did say um, the faculty of my generation, I don't know how they're going to do that unless somebody comes up with a product that makes it uh, possible to do that for them, right? So um, maybe that's something that some of you could take. I actually think the National Academy should take on a committee, just at least how could this possibly be done? And I think you should be the chair of that committee. <laughs> <laughs> Well, with all this great, thank you very much for being here. And to all of you who have young kids in college or grandchildren, think about asking him to take them for a summer internship. <laughs> I'm serious. They have a lot of money. <laughs> and, <laughs> he got, and men and women, thank you very much for being here. Thank you.